Now, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce at this time one of the uh, people that uh, has not only the academic experience, but uh, applied the, the uh, law, the international law, the Israeli law, uh, actually, and fulfilling one of the most difficult tasks in our uh, government. And that is uh, Pnina Sharvit Baruch, who is a professor of the faculty of the Tel Aviv University Law School, where she teaches public international law. Advocate Sharvit Baruch retired from the Israeli Defense Forces as a colonel in 2009 after serving 20 years in the International Law Department, over five years of which she was the head of the department. And in this capacity, this was between 2003 and 2009, and in this capacity she was the senior legal advisor responsible for advising the Israeli leadership, both military and political, on a wide variety of issues related to international law, including, among others, the Middle East peace process, occupation law, and the law of armed conflict. Beginning in 1993, Advocate Shavit Baruch served as a legal advisor and member of the Israeli delegations to the peace negotiations with both Syria and the Palestinians. She participated in most of the negotiation sessions and summits, including those in Paris, Cairo, Wye River Plantation, Taba, and Shepherdstown. In recent years, she was involved in advising commanders and government decision makers on issues relating to the law of armed conflict. She also participated in international expert meetings and conferences on this issue, focusing on the practical questions of applying the law of armed conflict in asymmetric warfare scenarios. Advocate Shavit Baruch holds LLB magna cum laude and LLM magna cum laude degrees from Tel Aviv University. Nina, you have the floor. Now, now I have the challenge of also finishing in 20 minutes. I took the time of uh, Professor Amy Bell, and I'm very happy I'm following uh, Professor Bell because uh, because he is really he already demonstrated some of the points I'm going to make, so that will make I think uh, we will make our uh, talks complementary and maybe give you the full picture. As, and as was said, I was the among other things I was the legal advisor uh, in charge of the department, the international law department during Operation Cast Lead or the Gaza operation, whatever we call it. So um, when I read the Golston report, I must say on a personal note, I, I really felt sick. I mean, I couldn't even read it. I had to read it only in the mornings because if I would read it before I went to sleep, I couldn't sleep the whole night. It was so shocking to see how, how things can be distorted in such a way and um, very frustrating too. So in my short presentation, I, I want to first demonstrate the way uh, laws of armed conflict are applied by the IDF in the process of making operational decisions. And then I will try to address the gap between the legality of such decisions on the one hand and their legitimacy or illegitimacy on the other. So as legal advisors, one of our jobs was to be uh, in charge of giving legal advice already in the, um, what we call the planning process which includes, first of all, preparing operational plans. Operational plans or plans prepared by, uh, by the commanders before any kind of a war or operation takes, it, uh, takes place. They are planned in advance, uh, prepared in advance. And in these plans, we saw our job, and it was also the commanders accepted that, as putting in the legal aspects into the command. We always insisted that it is not that the, co that the um, plan includes a legal annex, because we know that if there's a legal annex, the only ones that will read it are the lawyers, but that the legal, that the legal uh, points and that the legal aspects are incorporated into the plan itself. Now, these plans form the basis for the commands. Once an operation is decided upon, these plans form the basis for the command itself, the operational command, and here again, when the plans are translated into commands, we again are involved again in 
uh, seeing to it that the legal aspects are incorporated again into the command itself, not again in a legal annex, in the command itself. So that's the one thing that we do in a, 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 to see to it that laws of armed conflict are incorporated. The second, again in the planning phase, is being involved in um, what we call the process of, um, of deciding on pre-planned targets. Now, the process, um, again, these are talks that are done beforehand in high levels, in different levels, of uh, preparing what we call the bank of targets. Uh, and there, uh, <coughs> sorry, in this bank, eventually, each target has its own page. And that page includes all the, the, all the relevant information regarding the target. This includes the intelligence regarding the target, uh, an aerial photo, a map of the target, striking element data, the head of the uh, operations directions, and the legal aspect. Now, every pre-planned target is referred to the commanding levels for authorization. Of course, the, the level of authorization is determined by the sensitivity of the target. And it can sometimes be a level of uh, the prime minister or the cabinet. Um, with regard to the legal aspects so of the legal advisor uh, sitting in the decision, in the, in the, um, in the meeting, uh, defines uh, and gives the legal opinion. But if it is, again, uh, sensitive or if there are legal dilemmas, these are brought to the higher levels of uh, the military advocate general and even the um, attorney general. Now, the legal position uh, includes, there are three options in this page. Um, allowed, problematic, and forbidden. Uh, allowed are all those targets that pose no problem. I mean, if we have uh, military bases, uh, um, ammunition uh, uh, storage places, uh, these are allowed targets. There's no question about it. There's no real legal problem. Um, the forbidden ones, on the other hand, are those that are not lawful targets. Um, that are purely civilian targets, um, and those are forbidden. They still are included in the bank, by the way, just to know that they have been checked. We don't have to recheck them or reinvent them again, but they are termed as forbidden. The problematic uh, uh, targets are, uh, from the legal point of view, are those that are more complex. Uh, usually, we're talking about civilian targets that are used um, for military purposes. Now, uh, or that uh, they have a certain attribute that makes them into a uh, military target, or what we call dual-use targets, like um, um, electric, uh, electricity, uh, um, gas stations, bridges, roads, uh, those targets that have a civilian purpose but can also serve a military purpose. Now, in defining and distinguishing between what is a lawful target and not, uh, the principle that was already mentioned here uh, that we apply, the legal principle, is the principle of distinction. Now, according to the principle of distinction, we must distinguish between civilian um, targets or civilian objects and uh, what we call military objects. The first are not allowed to be the uh, object of an attack, and the second are. Uh, but the uh, definition of what is a military objective is, uh, includes not only what is a pure military objective, but also civilian objects that, that, that by their use, nature, even location, um, give the other side a military advantage that makes them into a lawful object. So we must already understand that according to the principle of distinction, civilian objects can be a lawful target in, some, in uh, certain circumstances, and we have to define these circumstances um, in this uh, uh, process. Um, once, a once a target appears in the say, target bank, that doesn't mean that it immediately can be attacked, because sometimes there's, time that pl there's a lapse of time between the preparation of the bank and uh, the attack on the target. So in such a case, prior to the actual decision to attack, all the data and considerations, including the legal ones, must be updated and reviewed. And this is the process with regard to pre-planned targets. Now, even once a target is defined as lawful target, that is not the end of the story, because prior to attack, one must still assess, as again was mentioned before, that the attack is proportionate. We have to adhere to the principle of proportionality. 
Now this means that we have to balance the military advantage on the one hand, anticipated from the attack on this object, and on the other, the collateral damage anticipated to civilians and civilian objects. An attack is lawful according to the laws of armed conflict only if the expected collateral damage is not excessive to the military advantage expected from the attack. So we have here a balancing process. By the way, it gives the advantage to the military advantage because only if the collateral damage is not excessive, only then, uh, if it is deemed excessive, will it be an unlawful attack. Um, and how do we do this balancing? What is the formula? Well, of course, there is no formula. It is a question of discretion, and what is important to note is that the laws of armed conflict set a standard as that of the reasonable military commander. This is not a legal decision. The lawyer does not make the balancing process. The military commander does, and the standard is the, the reasonable military commander, which means that two commanders can reach two different decisions, and they both can still be deemed reasonable. This also means that the fact, the sheer fact, that civilians are harmed by an attack does not in itself prove it was disproportionate and hence unlawful. Um, sometimes they might have not been expected, it might have not been an anticipated result, but even if it was an anticipated result, as I just said, the laws of armed conflict can still allow the attack if this was not excessive. Um, so, the laws of armed conflict do not expect nor require no civilian casualties. That is one of the harsh realities of war. When making a decision to attack a target, uh, precautions must be taken with a view to minimizing collateral damage, such as carrying out attacks, say, on public places at night, uh, choosing the direction of attack, that, uh, for example, that an empty field will be behind the, the striking, the direction, not a... Uh, uh, a house, or so, uh, finding, using accurate weapons when possible, there's a whole issue of what weapons are used. Another point is that, uh, if possible, uh, ish warnings must be issued before an attack in order to enable the civilians to protect themselves. Uh, Israel uh, carried out, already in the Second Lebanon War and uh, in the operation, in the Gaza operation, unprecedented a specific and, uh, uh, and very vast warnings. It included general warnings, but also in the Gaza operation, specific warnings to specific houses prior to their attack. I'm talking about houses that, for example, were deemed as uh, where we knew that ammunition was being stored. And the idea was not to harm the people living in the building, but just get to the ammunition. And then phone calls were made surveillance was, made, was, taken, was carried out to see if they left the building. If they haven't left the building, again, phone calls were made. F shots were fired next to the building to warn the people. Surveillance, again, these are <laughs> means of surveillance or something that is very scarce. We don't have a lot of them. And these were, were, were still used just in order to see to it people really left the building prior to the decision to attack. And if they haven't left, then again, a new decision had to be made if you can still ca go out, carry out the, the attack or not. Um, Goldson Report, by the way, finds this system of warnings is inf insufficient. <laughs> and I must tell you that when I spoke about this system, and we just recently also have an article about warnings prior to attacks, and when I, when I spoke to it to other legal advisors from other militaries, they always say, well, you know, if you ever speak about it or write about it, just emphasize that this is not a legal requirement. That you Israelis went like, above any, any standard required. Um, so uh, this is the way we went out of our way to try to minimize casualties for civilians. For many reasons, including moral ones, legal ones, the understanding of what effect that has on the uh, arena, uh, both internal and external. Now, this is what, what, what happens with any kind of target, including the pre-planned targets. We must also understand what we have during an operation is not only pre-planned targets, but also what we term immediate targets, those that surface during the combat. The soldiers are in the field, suddenly they see a missile or rocket just about to be launched, or 
just has been launched or that someone is firing at them or at another force nearby. These are targets that, 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 that uh, they find while they are there. It's not pre-planned targets. Now, in this situation, there is limited intelligence if any, they don't know if the building that the rocket is stayed is a, is a, and, and that was the way the Hamas operates, of course, is to fire from these uh, uh, very, uh, uh, from these uh, uh, populated areas. We don't know who's in the building, what is in the building. Uh, there's not much time to, to analyze. So there's limited time, limited intelligence. Um, not always a possibility to ask for surveillance and other measures and means and more accurate means. Um, no legal advisor, and the legal uh, and the one making the decision is also a younger and less, less experienced than those making the decisions on these pre-planned targets. And uh, this does not mean that the law is irrelevant. Still, the commander has to make his assessment and his decision according to the standard of a reasonable military commander. Um, and when we judge his decision after the fact, according to the laws of armed conflict, this has to be done in light of the information available to him at the time of the decision and taking into account these extreme circumstances without the benefit of hindsight. So, after showing how good we are <laughs> and how much law, the laws of armed conflict has and does take an important part in the decisions, in operational decisions, then the question is, why do we have such a difficult time persuading of the legitimacy of these operations? We are, why do we have this gap between the legality and legitimacy? And I'm not going to talk about the political level, which is, of course, the important one, but I want to focus more on the way the legitimacy of IDF actions is put into question. And I only have six minutes to do that, so it will be a very quick survey. So I think I, there are three levels I want to address in this analysis. First of all, the definition of the situation. How is the situation defined? Secondly, the implementation of the relevant law. And thirdly, the evaluation of the facts. Now, Professor Bell has made it easy for me because he has already given some examples. But to start with the definition of the situation, the first question when we have to analyze the law applying to situation is what is the situation. And here what we see is, many, is the question if a situation is termed as an armed conflict or as a law enforcement situation. Now there are those that say that any kind of engagement or conflict with terrorist organizations, with non-state actors, is not a war, is not an armed conflict. These are criminals, we are dealing with law enforcement. And of course, if it is a law enforcement situation, the rules of when and how can you use force are much more limited, much more limiting. There's a, the laws of uh, human rights law it has a, a lot to say. And by defining, by thus defining situations as law enforcement, so there's already a, a, a big uh, um, limitation on the use of force, on what you can do. Um, another question of definition, which I won't enter to, is the definition with regard to the Gaza Strip, specifically as an, as an occupied territory or not, which is relevant to how much responsibility do we have to the civilians there. But I won't, I don't have time to go into that. Now, the main, the, the second issue if, is, again, what laws apply. So I said the, fir the first is the definition, the second is the implementation. Now, if it is a law, law enforcement, a situation, of course, the rules of law enforcement apply. But even when it is accepted that it is an armed conflict situation, as Professor Bell just demonstrated, what is done there is that the rules that apply, the laws of armed conflict that do apply, are interpreted in a very narrow way, in a very limiting way. And I won't repeat because he gave some examples, but one other example is also who is termed a lawful uh, a lawful target when we're talking about combatants and civilians, giving a very limiting inter interpretation, for example, to even uh, members of the armed forces of the other side, if they, since they are not a state and it is not an army, seeing them, for example, as civilians who can be attacked only when they are engaging now in hostilities, not a moment before, not a moment after, a very limiting uh, a way to interpret the law, and there are other examples. Another problem with the issue of the implementation of the law is that 
there tends to be, um, uh, or there's, there's a tendency today uh, to incorporate more and more human rights law standards into armed conflict situations. Now, human rights law has a different rationale, and its rationale is that you have a duty, the state has a duty towards civilians, towards any person out there. And according to this, this logic, if a civilian is harmed in any way, so this immediately make, uh, leads to a presumption that someone is to blame, someone did something wrong. A civilian is not supposed to be harmed by a state, any civilian. Um, and, this, this, this say, uh, and then from this, of course, the, uh, as, as was explained, the presumption of if civilians were killed, either they were targeted on purpose, but even if not, something was done wrong. At least negligence, even maybe more, more than that. Uh, and this, of course, uh, does, gives no appreciation or understanding to the realities and complexities of armed conflict situations where civilians do get harmed and it doesn't mean that something, somebody has done something wrong. Another point with regard to the legal aspect, which I have no time to enter into, is the mixture between what I call the use ad bellum and the use in bellum standards. And it's a very legal point, but just in one, in one sentence, um, according to the laws of armed conflict, it is not relevant who is the right side, who is, who is the aggressor, who is defending himself, who is the victim, who is the, the aggressor. The rules apply to both sides at the same time. The, the, the rules that apply once an armed conflict is uh, underway are the same. But what we see is that there is today, uh, uh, again, a tendency to say the one side is to blame, the one side is the aggressor, the other side is the victim. In our case, Israel is the aggressor, the Palestinians are the victim. And now, once we term Israel as an aggressor, anything it does within this armed conflict is uh, um, deemed excessive and unlawful. So we are mixing the two, uh, and this, is, this contradicts a very important principle of the laws of armed conflict. There's a mixture between who is to blame, and now if you're to blame, anything you do is unlawful, which is exactly not the, not, yes, uh, not the rationale of armed conflict, of the laws of armed conflict, which make this differentiation, which say it's not important who's the aggressor, who is not, the laws apply to both sides equally. On the other hand, another important principle of uh, the laws of armed conflict is that there is no reciprocity. So even if the one side does not abide by the rules, the other side still has to, to abide by them. Now this principle is, a, is still a accepted and adhered to. I don't, I don't say that it's not a, a, a right principle, but the combination of the two means that, for example, while Israel is fighting uh, another side um, which is not abiding by the law, Israel is also expected to continue to abide by the laws of armed conflict, and since it is also viewed as the aggressor, anything it does, even if it is according to the laws of armed conflict, is deemed unlawful. So we have one side fighting free of any rules and the other side fighting with both hands tied behind the back. The third point, which I will skip because I have no time and because uh, Professor Bell addressed it, is the manipulation of the facts. And of course, this is done by a very flawed methodology of accepting anything said against us, rejecting anything that supports our claims. Um, and they, of course, also the point that no mistakes happen. Whatever happened was done purposefully, even four soldiers and 43 of our soldiers that were killed and 43 wounded were done, were not a mistake, apparently, because no mistakes happen. So the bottom line is, in this way, um, um, Goldstone Report, other similar reports doing this manipulation of law and facts are used as a tool in the campaign against Israel, in the campaign delegitimizing Israel, but also more widely, for what is relevant also for other countries, are used as a tool to make those trying to fight terrorism and trying to do it lawfully and legitimately almost an impossible mission to achieve. Thank you.